We hear often that uh, no steel frame building has ever collapsed through the fire. In reality, it's even stronger than that. No steel frame building, superstructure type building, has ever collapsed through itself to the ground for any reason, any reason. Hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, airplane hits, any reason other than controlled demolition. I'm not talking about a, a warehouse with a single uh, roof, which is basically one beam. I'm talking about a superstructure where it's a grid stacked one on top of the other. That has never happened. No building with that type of construction has ever collapsed in the history of the world. And I want you to look at this. This shows the, the skeleton of this building and look at the enormous grid of steel that's put together here. And that sort of tells you why no steel frame, um, that's why I'm using the term superstructure. It's not just a roof with trusses. It's a superstructure, it's a grid of steel. So they say that these beams expanded and pushed this girder off its seat on this column and this column and caused that floor to fall down, collapsing eight other floors below it, leaving column 79 unsupported laterally enough to cause it to buckle and that that precipitated the entire interior to progress progressively first from column 79 back to 81 and then from that's north north to south and then east to west they say the entire interior collapsed first and left an exterior shell which then collapsed on its own due to its own being overloaded by its own weight that's what they say how can the core have been completely collapsed before global, global collapse when the screen wall and West Penthouse have just started moving a second before the exterior? They're not even below the roof line before the full exterior comes down. I'll do it frontwards and backwards for you. Let's just show it a little bit further there. See the movement on the, the exterior? and the interior is still there. Do you see it? The exterior started coming down. The, east, the screen wall and the west penthouse haven't even gone below the, the roof line. And this is telling us that the entire interior collapsed before the exterior. This in and of itself shows in this report is unfortunately bogus. And this shows us, told us that the lateral stiffness of that girder was much less than the axial stiffness of those beams. Okay, we accept that. But now in the analysis where they want to say the beams buckled, we have to ask the question, well, where did the stiffness come on the girder to buckle the beam? Something's got to be stopping the beam. There's no answer to that. They just say it buckled. It's very confusing. Another thing we have to take a look at is just how far that girder would have had to be pushed for it to walk off its seat, as NIST suggests. NIST reported that the seat at column 79 was 11 inches wide. NIST says the girder had to be pushed at least five and a half inches, or half of that distance, to walk off the seat. NIST computer model had the steel reaching extreme temperatures and all the bolts and other connections failing within a matter of about two seconds. This is an example of how NIST computer modeling was not realistic. If we put the right values in the equation, including the length of the beam, which was 53 feet, the change in temperature for the beams, not the temperature they reached, but the change on the northeast corner from room temperature to 400 degrees, we see that the maximum expansion would be 3.3 inches. That's all it can do. And the 3.3 inches would not be enough to cause the girder to walk off its seat. Addition, they didn't test this situation. They could have easily put four or five beams together with a girder and a couple columns, even a one-story situation. We could do it on this stage and heat those beams up to 600 degrees centigrade and see if they can push that girder off. It won't happen. Structural engineers Ron Brookman uh, made a FOIA request to NIST in 2009 asking for calculations and analysis behind NIST's claim of girder walk-off. They wrote back, we are withholding 3,370 files. The NIST director determined that the release of these data might jeopardize public safety. The problem is there was no fires on floors five, six, and 10. 10 was right in the middle of this supposedly slender column. There's no fire. 
How'd they break the girder connections to the column? They don't say. The photographic evidence tells us that the fires on the northeast corner of floor 12 burned out nearly two hours before the building fell. NIST admits that its models did not use the observed fire activity from photos and videos as a model input. So again, this is not science. There's certain people trying to defend the, the present official story, try to say the collapse occurred over 16 seconds or some 14 to 16 seconds because they include the West Penthouse failure or East Penthouse failure. And uh, I think the question needs to be asked as to whether the East Penthouse failure was a distinct and separate event. The rate of fall of the building is an embarrassment to the official theory. Free fall is a small detail in the whole complex analysis, but it is not a minor issue. Buildings cannot fall at free fall through themselves because even a weakened building requires energy to break up the pieces, crush the concrete, and push things around. When the falling building pushes things, the fall is not free. The things push back, and the reaction forces will measurably slow the descent of the building. This is why one would reasonably expect crumbling structures to come down in a tumbling, halting, irregular manner. Even if you could buckle all the columns, the column resistance never goes to zero. There's always remaining resistance. You can't get the free fall. That's what this graph is showing you. Here's zero. It's this is what asymptotic means. I'm sure everybody's seen that in school. It's when the it's when the graph levels out and never reaches the x-axis, and it's a significant resistance. So you can't reach free fall during buckling. It's impossible. In this video, I have measured the velocity profile and the instantaneous acceleration of the building with orders of magnitude better precision than NIST. And I did it with zero budget, a free software tool commonly used in high school physics classes, and a copy of a video downloaded from the internet. I'm here plotting velocity as a function of time. The slope of this kind of graph gives the acceleration. Notice that the data hovers close to zero for nearly a second, and then it drops precipitously. From the moment of the drop, the slope of the line appears essentially constant for about two and a half seconds. The most accurate way to characterize the result is to say the acceleration of the building is indistinguishable from freefall. Notice that a little after the three second mark on our graph, about two and a half seconds after the building drops, the acceleration ceases to be uniform. This indicates that the falling building is starting to encounter more resistance. Let's return to the NIST final report on WTC7. Their claim is equivalent to saying the acceleration of the building is only 5 meters per second squared, which is 51% the acceleration of gravity. Our results, however, clearly show a significant stretch of time in which the acceleration of the building is indistinguishable from the acceleration of gravity itself. In other words, complete free fall. They did not use a method that sampled a position versus time to show the velocity profile, as was done here. The NIST report uses only two data points, the supposed start of the collapse and the time the roof line disappears from view. This is high school physics we're talking about. If they can't get the high school physics right, what confidence can we have in their multicolored, computer-animated whiz-bang simulations that tell us the exact sequence of girder failures without any physical evidence for any of it? I'm a high school teacher. I teach my students better lab practice than NIST demonstrates here. To measure and publish a meaningless average acceleration when sufficient data and a multi-million dollar budget are available to measure the actual velocity profile constitutes either gross incompetence or an attempt to obfuscate the issue. In short, the evidence is clear. We are witnessing not the collapse of a building, but its demolition. And we have received not a report from an independent scientific investigation, but a cover-up by a government agency. We were surprised that Tower 7 collapsed, uh, we being the team that investigated what occurred on that day. There was some damage to Tower 7 caused by the debris that hit it from Tower 1, but uh, the damage was certainly not similar in scope or magnitude to that caused by the aircraft hitting Towers 1 and 2. Uh, when you have a structural failure, uh, you carefully go through the debris field, uh, looking at each item, photographing every beam as it collapsed and every uh, uh, column where it is in the ground, and you pick them up very carefully and you uh, look at each element. 
We were unable to do that in the case of Tower 7. So why? <laughs> why weren't they able to do that? The narrator did step in and, after his comments and say that the steel was removed for search and rescue. Um, even if they did <clears throat> have to take it away, why didn't they save it? Nobody does a failure analysis by not saving physical evidence. Nobody. If you were in a private industry and you did that, you'd be out of business. You'd be taken to court if you tried to do a failure analysis without saving physical evidence. This is, it's ridiculous. And I think it's worthy of an investigation in and of itself. NIST said that there were no Building 7 steel samples, but those samples were available. They were just left unexplained. NIST said that they took three years for their investigation, but they took at least five years. NIST said that there were seven hours fires in Building 7, but evidence suggests the fires were much shorter in duration. NIST said that there was no water to put out the fires, but Building 7 sprinklers were functional and water was available. NIST said that there were four hour fires in the northeast corner of floor 12, but only 20 minutes of combustibles were available in any given location. And we've seen that the duration from photos could not have been as, as long. NIST said there were no shear studs on the girder. This is contradicted by NIST's own interim report and by the building project manager, Salvarinas. NIST did not use photos of fire as model input. That's because the photos showed the fires were out. And NIST said the floor slab was not heated in their model, or NIST did not actually heat the floor slab in their model. And differential thermal expansion cannot be measured without heating both the beam and the slab. NIST ignored previous findings on the Building 7 steel samples. No physical tests were done to confirm the mechanisms NIST proposed. Other physical tests have shown that NIST mechanisms are unrealistic. The fire theory is contradicted by the known fire resistance plan. The fires in Building 7 lasted only 20 minutes in a given location, while the steel components were rated for hours of fire resistance. NIST's final theory was based entirely on computer simulations that are not based on evidence. The fire initiation, fire spread, and fire loads were based on arbitrary assumptions. The Case B assumption used was arbitrary and biased. NIST fire modeling contradicts the photographic evidence. The fires in the critical area were out long before collapse. NIST contradicted itself and known facts about shear studs on that critical girder. And the maximum thermal expansion possible could not have caused the girder to walk off its seat. The steel evidence was destroyed or unexplained. NIST's final theory followed years of failed hypotheses. NIST's final theory could not have been predicted. NIST's report is self-contradictory and contradicts other known facts. NIST's report is deceptive. And NIST's final theory for collapse initiation is unscientific and false. Engineers find it easy to live in a reality-based world. We have to, because we have to build things to work. You don't have any room for fantasy. It has to work. Um, but I would submit that adults, especially parents, have to do the same thing. Um, you don't want your kid running on ice. You don't want him running with a jagged piece of glass in his hand or dropping glasses on floors. You don't want him driving a car without brakes. So we have to live in a reality-based world because there's dangers if we don't. And um, that also goes for scrutinizing a report on a crime that we don't accept a fantastic explanation. It's unacceptable because we don't, if we do accept that there's danger, the danger involved is that the criminals that committed the crime are emboldened to continue it and perform other crimes. Okay.